we've discussed Shinji Iwai a few times here on Cinema Nippon. Notably, one of our first videos concerned the style and substance of his 1995 film, Love Letter. It's been a while since we've gotten to him, and we thought it high time to re-examine one of his more recent projects, that being 2016's A Bride for Rip Van Winkle. There's a lot more ground to cover with Shinji Iwai in the future, but before we delve into this film, which will already take up more than enough of our time, why don't we discuss in brief what Shinji Iwai was up to for 21 years between Love Letter and A Bride for Rip Van Winkle. Love Letter was released in 1995 to critical acclaim, cementing Shinji Iwai as a major player in Japanese film during the 1990s. Prior to this, he had worked on short films and television movies many of which have been collected in several box sets in Japan, but have never made it this side of the Pacific. Once the success of Love Letter hit, however, Iwai spent the better part of the following decade writing and directing for the big screen, more or less leaving the mediums of short film and television behind. Iwai directed five more films following Love Letter, the last of which was Hana and Alice in 2004. After that, he left the Japanese fiction film scene for 12 years, we say Japanese because in 2011 he directed his first English-language project, Vampire, a mixed reception film which details the life of a teacher who believes himself to be a vampire. Also during this gap, Iwai directed two documentaries, the first being 2006's The Kon Ichikawa Story, a portrait of one of Japan's greatest directors detailing his life and his final year of active filmmaking. The second, 2011's Friends After 311, saw EY interviewing a number of political and artistic personalities following the disasters of March 11, 2011. EY's only other credits during this period were a segment in the 2008 anthology film New York I Love You and the 2015 anime prequel to Hana and Alice titled The Murder Case of Hana and Alice. So why do you think EY left feature filmmaking for so long in the first place? And why did he come back for today's subject? Well, I can't speak to the latter with any certainty, but I have a pretty good idea why he might have left in the first place. You see, in 2004, EY's consistent cinematographer, Noboru Shinoda, unexpectedly passed away due to liver failure. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, Shinoda had worked with EY since the 1994 TV movie Lunatic Love, which was EY's last project before Undo which was his last short film before Love Letter. Which means... Right, that was a little convoluted. That means that Shinoda and Iwai had worked together on every single one of Iwai's theatrical films up until Hana and Alice. Of course, Shinoda didn't work exclusively with Iwai, so his last project was actually Crying Out Love in the Center of the World, also released in 2004 and directed by prominent independent director Isao Yukisara. Given that the cinematographers changed on each project following Shinoda's passing, I think it might be safe to infer that Iwai wasn't comfortable continuing his fiction work without Shinoda. The Kon Ichikawa story saw Shinichi Tsunoda acting as cinematographer, while Vampire saw Iwai himself helming the position. His segment in New York I Love You places Michael McDonough in the role, and more recently, Friends After 311 saw Shinichi Tsunoda splitting duties with Chigi Kanbe who would return as the sole cinematographer on The Murder Case of Hannah and Alice and A Bride for Rip Van Winkle. If you ask me, it sounds like EY finally found another kindred spirit to work with in Kanbei. As a result of this change in cinematographer, we see a number of handheld shots. Love Letter was composed mostly of stationary or sweeping crane shots, while here the action is more intimate usually occurring indoors with characters being placed exceptionally close to one another. You're not going to get any wide shots of women yelling at mountains here, is basically what we're saying. Earlier works with Shinoda, like All About Lily Choo Choo, saw the use of handheld cameras, though in that particular case it was for a specific reason. That film was EY's first to be produced entirely with digital film, meaning the cameras were smaller and more mobile than what he or Shinoda had worked with prior. This allowed them a greater amount of freedom to experiment. Now, 14 years later, we see how EY and Kanabe have learned to use the medium in a more structured fashion. But hey, enough about EY's background, let's talk about A Bride for Rip Van Winkle. A Bride for Rip Van Winkle is like our previously covered love letter, in that it's an intimate film. Don't go into this one expecting thrilling action and explosions. 
Instead, understand from the get-go what you're going to be seeing is a very subtle, nuanced drama designed specifically for our hyper-connected internet age. Think more along the lines of Happy Hour than any of the more exciting movies we might have covered here. The film follows Nanami, played by Haru Kuroki, who is probably best well known for her voice roles in Wolf Children, Ami and Yuki, and The Boy and the Beast. Nanami is a temporary school teacher who becomes engaged. Her fiancé, Tetsuya, is played by Go Jibiki, who got his start in film with EY's own April Story. The story of the film follows the relationship of these two from their engagement through their marriage and into their domestic life. Of course, you likely couldn't have a very interesting three or four hour movie predicated on just that s predicated on just that simple of a plot, which is where Amuro comes in. Oh, did we not mention this movie is three and four hours long? We'll, we'll get there. Amuro is played by Go Ayano who appeared in not one, but two of the Best Picture contenders the same year today's film was released, those being 64 Part 1 and Rage. Amado runs a family rental service, which should probably sound familiar to anyone who knows about Noriko's dinner table, or the real-world phenomenon of family rental. Yes, I would like to order one brother, please. All things in good time, my friend. All things in good time. Anyway, Nanami has a bit of an issue where the number of family members she's in touch with isn't very big, meaning that her half of the wedding party will be nearly empty. She contracts Amuro to fill her side with fake family members, which in turn leads to some pretty quirky and awkward situations. This in turn leads Nanami to meet Mashiro, played by Koko, a pop star who only has two other acting credits to her name. Mashiro talks about being an actress, making the family rental business a perfect fit for her M.O. That's about all we can give away about the plot without spoiling too much. And hey, there's more than one reason this episode is going to be in two parts. Not only is it excessively long, we actually need to give away a bit of the plot in our analysis. So if you haven't seen the film, feel free to keep watching as this part will be spoiler free. As we mentioned before, the film is available in two versions. Well, three, actually. The first is the theatrical cut which clocks in at about two hours, and which doesn't seem to have made it onto home video, so we can strike that one off the list. The second is a three-hour director's cut, and the third is a four-hour TV cut, where the action is divided into six 40-minute episodes. As for which one we might recommend, well... ¿Por qué no ambos? The film was picked up by the American distributor Eleven Arts several years back, who offered short-run screenings of the three-hour version in the States. No word has come out yet on home video releases, and in the few years since this theatrical run, no additional releases have arrived over here. Unfortunately, this makes Bride one of EY's films that remains more difficult to acquire in America. If you're hungry for that four-hour version, the Hong Kong company Panorama has released both versions on DVD and Blu-ray, both with English subtitles. Bear in mind that these copies are not region coded for American viewing, so you'll need to use a PC or otherwise change the region code on your DVD or Blu-ray player to view them, but they are available, which is a huge step in the right direction. So please, whichever route you take, go view at least one version of the film after this episode and before part two, as today's video will provide you with the background information which will aid in understanding themes presented in the film. We would recommend viewing both versions, though we know 7 hours is a long time to request of you guys. EY himself has commented that he prefers the 3 hour cut, given that it's, well, the director's cut. The 4 hour version, meanwhile, is parsed into episodes for a different type of pacing, meaning that the runtime flies by without you realizing it. The reason we don't just say that you should watch this longer version? Well, each has material that the other doesn't. That's right, it's not just an extra hour of material in the TV cut. Both have scenes removed, added, extended, or slightly rearranged. We'll get into this in the second part of the video, as there's something to be said for the decision to release the film in this manner. But know that either version is perfectly acceptable, as we did the work of going through and finding as many differences as we could. That was a long two days. Our aim today is going to be to examine the customs and traditions relating to the various ceremonies we see throughout the film. The narrative is drenched in this tradition, and it could significantly help you to pick up some of the subtleties if you go in with some foreknowledge. So let's jump right into that. In Japan, there's a saying that 
you're born Shinto, you marry Christian, and you die Buddhist. This relates to the diverse nature of ceremonies which your everyday Japanese citizen will take part in throughout their life. A bride for Rip Van Winkle centers around four major ceremonies, two related to marriage and two to death, as well as one unofficial ceremony. The first of these traditions is the betrothal ceremony, which occurs very early in the film's runtime. This ceremony, known as Yuino, dates to the Muromachi period, and is observed even today, though some changes have occurred in the mm, 700 year span since its inception. Namely, that the ceremony of Yuino was first instituted due to marriages being arranged by parents on either side of a family, with the completion of Yuino and later marriage signifying these families' bonding. As has become much more common in the post-war period, it's now expected that young people will seek out partners rather than having their unions arranged. In spite of this, Yuino is still observed regularly. During the ceremony, the group's family offers money known as kinpo to the bride's family. In turn, both sides offer symbolic gifts to one another. These gifts can include hakama, a type of pants, which represent fidelity. Naganoshi, a clamshell to represent longevity, and konbu, a type of kelp which stands for health in childbearing. After the exchange of gifts, both families share sake. This is an ancient Shinto tradition, signifying a bond between two people or groups. Prior to partaking in Yueno, it's not uncommon to see couples announcing engagement with the groom offering his bride an engagement ring. While engagement rings are fairly common, they're less popular than they were in previous decades. Some members of online forums discussing the question explained that proposing without rings is a common event nowadays. In 1959, diamonds became legal to import into Japan, but by 1967, only 5% of brides-to-be would wear them. By 1982, this rose to 60%, though numbers seem to be lower today. It seems that while engagement rings are common, they're not something that is viewed as required for marriage. Speaking of diamond rings, we also learned that pearls were initially more popular as a material for engagement rings. This makes sense given Japan's relationship with fishing. Of course, diamond rings weren't even a thing until the 1930s due to, well, advertising. So while the engagement ring is not entirely a set in stone <laughs> tradition, we can glean that it was likely introduced through post-war Western influence. Speaking of that Western influence, wedding rings seem to be a byproduct of the introduction of Christianity, namely Catholicism and Protestantism, into the country. So that one is on us too. One last bit about the engagement business is that we see Nanami and Tetsuya live apart prior to their wedding. We learned in our research that sometimes couples in Japan live apart for work even after their wedding. According to a survey conducted by Japan Info on the dating site Match Alarm, women and men are both willing to marry before committing to cohabitation, though the age at which they do so is different. Thus, living apart before getting married is a pretty common thing in modern Japan, it seems. And getting back to the westernization of tradition, this leads us straight into our second ceremony, the wedding proper. As we see in episode 5 of the 4 hour cut of the film, our main characters visit a shop that exclusively sells the typical white wedding dresses. This stands in contrast to the traditional garb of a Shinto wedding, that those outside of Japan may associate with the Japanese tradition. Again, this might be due to the influence of Christianity in the country, though Japanese weddings are also noted as being somewhat showier than American weddings, if you can believe it. This is because it's not uncommon for brides and grooms to wear the traditional kimono during the ceremony, then change their dresses for the reception. While some couples will opt for Christian weddings wholly, like they do in A Bride for Rip Van Winkle, others will buy and wear the stereotypical white wedding dress exclusively for the reception. As a side note, the headdress that we see in Shinto weddings which accompanies the bride's kimono, and which we see in our episode on house, is called a wataboshi. It's meant to represent modesty and humility, and dates back to the Muromachi period. So as we can see, the Japanese wedding at this point in history is a bit of a mixed bag, containing elements of both Shinto tradition and Christian ceremony. During the proper wedding of the film between Nanami and Tetsuya, we observe that the service is conducted by a Caucasian man who seems to speak English as a first language, and who appears to be a Catholic minister. The whole thing seems to be for show to the extent that, when he says, Amen, no one else repeats after him. Seriously, this guy comes totally out of left field. We're just trucking along, and then all of a sudden it's like, Where'd you come from, white boy? 
This is allowed because unlike other territories in Japan, the wedding ceremony is completely removed from the legal aspect of getting married. Unlike in America, where the officiant actually files paperwork, the person marrying you in Japan is just for show. And you pretty much have to file your marriage license form with City Hall on your own. This means that your officiant could literally be anyone. Uncle Hirohito, that mutt from the alleyway, your grandma's horse. In turn, this leeway has led to a trend in the past 10 or 20 years of white men being wedding officiants because their presence and appearance is indicative of the type of fantasy white wedding advertisers try to sell. So yeah, where'd you come from white boy indeed? This guy seems out of nowhere, but actually makes a lot of sense. Later, we go to the reception after the wedding, which for the sake of this episode, we're calling part of the wedding ceremony. As we stated, a lot of the reception is extremely showy, and actually wasn't taken from American tradition, though it's likely been changed due to this influence by now. Instead, a traditional Japanese reception is called a kekkon hiroen, and involves much pomp and circumstance. This will typically involve the newlyweds sitting on a stage before everyone, while their attendees will provide speeches, sing songs, give performances, and so on. Another common element that we don't see in the Western tradition is known as the words of appreciation to the newlywed's parents. Here, the bride and groom take some time to reflect on how their parents have raised them and helped them to get to their wedding day. Typically, this is the time for the bride and groom to speak before the audience, but in the film we observe two sets of actors who are supposed to represent the bride and groom at different points in their lives. This would likely indicate their affluence and their perceived need to have a flashy wedding and reception, something that we'll discuss in the next episode. Shinto weddings and receptions are typically attended only by the immediate family of the couple. This could serve as one explanation for the bombastic nature of the wedding reception in modern Japan, as the country has increasingly embraced American traditions. In the film, however, we see that Nanami and Tetsuya are taking the best of both worlds, and that heavy family attendance at their wedding is in fact one of the catalysts for the main action of the film. This can be linked as well to the traditional value placed on the family unit in some regards. As one last note on the topic of weddings, some sources claim that the honeymoon is a tradition which Shinto has shared with the West for some time, while others claim that it is a byproduct of Christian weddings. We can't be sure, but we figured it was worth mentioning. Whether it was a thing previously, it's certainly a commonality today, though it is not seen in the film. Another ceremony found in the film, and the first related to death, is that of the funeral. In Japan, funerals are ceremonial, and usually adhere to Buddhist principles which can be seen in how the body is handled and how the wake is conducted. First, the body of the deceased is washed and they are laid out with their head facing north. A Buddhist priest recites an incantation before placing the body in a coffin. Next, the close family and friends of the deceased are invited to the wake, where the coffin is put on display. A Buddhist priest will recite an incantation in front of a photograph of the deceased while the others look on. He may use what are called juzu or nenju, prayer beads which are similar to a rosary. These beads double as a ward against evil spirits and as symbols of good luck. They are used for a number of practices and show up in weddings and other ceremonies as well. The following day, at the funeral proper, the coffin is carried to a crematorium, and the attendees watch as the body is immolated. According to a survey, 99% of those who passed away in Japan in 2013 were cremated, meaning that this is an exceptionally common practice. Note, of course, when we say things like this, that we're talking about what is typical. Just as in America, it is typical to have a more Christian wedding or a more Christian funeral. This isn't to say that all Japanese funerals are conducted in this manner, but this is what you might expect on average. Next, the attendees of the funeral use chopsticks to collect the bone fragments left after the cremation, and carefully place them in an urn. It's important that these bones be placed feet first and head last, so that the deceased will not be buried upside down. This concludes the tradition of a Buddhist funeral, though it's far from the end of the mourning and remembrance for the deceased's friends and family. 
This brings us to our last ceremony observed in the film, that of the memorial. According to Buddhist belief, memorials are to be held on the 1st, 2nd, 6th, 12th, 16th, 22nd, 26th, and 32nd anniversaries of someone's passing. At a memorial service, each individual attendee lights incense for the deceased and prays at the grave. We've seen this process played out before in EY's own love letter, though here the ceremony is carried out more fully. Throughout one's life events, the presence of family is an incredibly important aspect of Japanese tradition. Whether these events are weddings, funerals, or memorials. In fact, it used to be common for several generations of a family to live together. When a couple would be married, the wife would more or less move in with the husband and his parents, and be adopted into the family. Even as recently as 1982, a survey found that popular perception believed a wife ought to put her husband in family life before her own life and interests. Thus, when they had children, three generations would be living under one roof. Now, however, even the nuclear family of a mother, father, and two children has begun to break down on average. In the 1980s, other filmmakers like Sogo Ishii criticized this concept. And today, another 35 years later, the paradigm has shifted even further. The Asia Society argues that the fragmentation of the agricultural family, as this three-generation scheme is known, began with the reconstruction following World War II. At this time, such a depression was occurring that the goal was to look out for your own generation first and foremost. This, combined with the economic miracle, led to the salaryman family, where the father would be married to his work and the wife became a housewife solely. As we see recently with women entering the workforce and getting married later, if at all however, even this is breaking down. Eldest sons have pretty much always been the heir of the family in Japanese tradition. See the emperor's lineage for evidence of this. In the case that a son was not produced, or if they died, it was not uncommon in old times to adopt a child and either have him, if a son, or the man she married, if a daughter, become the heir of the family. According to the Asia Society, the eldest son is also expected to care for his parents. Japanese women have the longest life expectancy of any group globally, and indicate that they want daughters to take care of them in old age. But traditionally, the role falls to the son. This is compounded when you consider the more recent family setups, where women were largely housewives tasked with raising their children. These elements combine to create an environment where an overprotective mother might hold a majority of her affection for her eldest son, which is something you ought to look for in today's film. However, the destruction of these different family structures has created some problems for these mother-son expectations. Difficulties have arisen as families have moved away from insular models, which has led to the creation of companies like those seen in Noriko's Dinner Table and A Bride for Rip Van Winkle. Extended families have grown apart, and the elderly will rent families in order to live out their idyllic fantasies of being close to their children or grandchildren. Speaking of people growing apart and the breakdown of idyllic fantasies, we can now use this forced transition to talk about the fifth unofficial tradition that we teased earlier. You see, there's not really a ceremony involved, but it can help us to understand the film if we know how going through a divorce works in Japan. And hey, it's a common enough thing nowadays that it might as well be a tradition, right? While Japan's divorce rate was on the rise in the post-war period, it seems to have peaked in the early 2000s. It's not as high as in other nations such as the United States, where Japan has 2.1 per 1,000 compared to America's 3.4 per 1,000. But it is still common enough to not leave one awestruck by its occurrence. What's more, we couldn't find data for 2016, but 2015 did see a slight uptick in the divorce rate, which may be indicative of the attitude towards divorce changing again. In fact, one in four Japanese marriages in 2015 involved at least one person who had been previously married. Since the initial airing of this episode, that rate has actually gone down even further, with the Statistics Bureau of Japan reporting that the divorce rate in 2019 was only 1.69 per 1,000. What's more, there are reports that in the quarantine of 2020, divorce rates have fallen even further. You see, as far back as 1982, Japanese women were beginning to have fewer children, work more, and get married older than those in previous generations. One Tokyo marriage counselor commented in 2008 that 70% of these divorces were due to the women's unhappiness in the marriage. 
Another commented that it was due in large part to the more common occurrence of men being married to their jobs. During this period of the early 70s was when opinions on divorce started to shift. Previously, it was not common at all, but at this point it became more common. In spite of this, it remains socially unacceptable. And also pretty difficult to do. Being a divorced individual in Japan can cause quite a bit of hardship. Namely, it can hurt one's chances at employment. Not to mention that divorced women do not readily get to restore their maiden names. And yet, even though it can cause such hardship, acquiring a divorce in Japan is subjectively easy. All that is needed is consent from both parties, and it's a done deal. If both parties are on board, there's no need to involve family courts or anything like that. Once more, let's reference the film Happy Hour. If you'd like to see an example of things not going easy, check that film out. In turn, the rise in divorce rates has seen the contemporary rise of some strange developments. Women and men alike have begun to tend toward marrying later in life, which can negatively affect a woman's image in the popular view. Typically, it's expected that a woman be married by 30 if she intends to lead a fulfilling life, whatever that means. Another development is the appearance of what are known as herbivore men. While the term is slightly misused at this point to indicate men who don't want to enter relationships whatsoever, the original meaning of the term was a man who still seeks sexual relationship but avoids marriage and children. According to one survey, some 61% of men in their 20s and 70% in their 30s claim the title of herbivore men. While we can't be 100% certain, these developments may suggest that the divorce rate has steadied itself due to potential divorcees removing themselves from the pool of married people. Like we said, this video is going to be ridiculously long if we continue from here. Besides, we want to give everyone the chance to experience a Bride for Rip Van Winkle for themselves with this foreknowledge in mind. Join us next time as we wrap up and we actually look at the film proper. 